Hello, one day is Thursday, April 16th, 2020, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending today. It looks like our attendance continues to climb, so somebody's finding the show. I just, I haven't had time, probably in a year to get out any, uh, or at least six months to get out the reminder, so thank you so much. All right, this is left over in here. So obviously, we talk about current market conditions, your questions on trading. If you don't mind, keep them on the slides. This should read 416, not 429, obviously. And uh, you can ask about anything you want once we get to the live charts, if you don't mind. Uh, wait until we get to the live charts if it's not relative to the slides, just so my ADD does not kick in. Anybody who's been to one of these shows know that I do go off on a rant here and there. And sometimes I've been told in the past that my rants are better than the show. <laughs> so... I guess that is an upside there. Your favorite stock picks, hold off for the charts until we get to the charts just so they don't get deleted by accident. And then also along the same lines for your benefit too, make sure you ask about one stock at a time. Just put the ticker in and then hit return. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or all this stuff up. All predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff could have between now and then. And I stole that from Greg Morris. So on my website, I haven't updated in a couple of days, but the homepage has the latest. So do check for the bear market updates. I've been trying to update that nearly every day, but days like today or week of charts, that becomes the updates. And then days when I do like my stock chart show, that becomes the update. So, but in general, I've been working hard to put out as many updates as possible. So check out that on my homepage when you get a chance. Okay. There's a lot of talk about the deck which we had recently. And as I've said in prior shows, it's not so much the signal in and of itself, but it's the magnitude of what happens afterwards. And as I often say, everything works better with trend. I've got some really cool patterns and they work great with trend. And then I've seen some people do some really complex stuff and seminars and i think to myself you know that little moving average you have in here instead of all those buy and sell signals you got printed all over your chart the little moving average you have plotted by default using something like landry light would probably have kept you on the right side of the market and i've been humbled by those type of things too because when i was looking years ago at my bow tie moving averages on like weekly charts and just by accident, I had the 50-day simple moving average plotted, which, by the way, I like to plot on occasion with the bow ties and look at the inflection of the bow ties going through that moving average. Now, to those who aren't familiar with bow ties, who are probably watching on YouTube after the recording of this, we're going to talk about bow ties a little bit in just a, in a few minutes. But the point is everything works better with trend and i discovered that just relationships around a 50 day or 50 week for longer term market timing moving average can be quite useful so everything works better with trend if you look at this chart here you can see we had the, the death cross and we had a pretty serious sell-off now back here we did have a little bit of a death cross and i have the ribbon at the bottom program bullish and bearish Bullish means the 50-day simple moving average, which I have in green on this chart, is above the 200-day simple moving average. And you can see that we did have a cross. What's interesting in that cross back there was it was already headed back up by the time the moving averages crossed over. So you could argue that, well, that was just kind of a whipsaw signal. But then notice, obviously, in the 2008 bear market. Now, this was kind of a cool bear market in that not, not all bear markets are cool, or not any bear market is cool. Obviously, you don't happen, but cool from a technician's perspective because the rollover was so slow. And we actually had weekly bow ties triggering right around this death cross, so before this death cross triggered. So that was kind of a cool thing. Anyway. As you can see, we did have follow through from this signal. And the magnitude of the move was pretty impressive. And even if you followed the, the signal mechanically, meaning that you sold when it crossed below and bought when it bought above, when it crosses back above, if you tried to say, 
you obviously in this particular case would have done really well. Now, keep in mind, as I've said before, and I've talked with Rob Hanna about this. Rob Hanna does a lot of programming and mechanical testing, and he's a real good guy, by the way. I, I made a joke once, and I called him a scumbag as a joke, complete joke, believe me. And man, his uh, I got attacked for weeks from his clients, and it was a joke, you know. <laughs> anyway, we go back and forth on stuff. He's a real good guy. But he's done the testing, and I talked to him a while back, and he says it's only a slight edge. If memory serves, it's like 4% buying and selling on the signals. But the thing you have to realize, like anything, it works better with trend, as I just said, and it's the magnitude of what happens. Sometimes you'll have a huge sell-off in the market, and the market comes back, and by the time it all, all the signals end up like netting out. You'd have, you'd have sold and then the market sold off really hard and it came all the way back up and you'd have broken even on the trade or worse, maybe even lost a little bit of money. But in the meantime, that market might have dropped 30 or 40%. So my point is, it's the magnitude of what happens after a death cross or any other sell signal for that matter. So you can see pretty serious sell-off here. But as I said, you can look at anything and anything or everything works better with trend. So we had lots of Landry light here, meaning, meaning that the lows, I'm sorry, the highs are less than the 50 day moving average in this particular case. So that's actually the 200 day moving average. And notice that if you go all the way down that entire trend, except for one little kiss, the entire trend was contained, so to speak, by that 200-day moving average. So something as simple as Landry Light will help to keep you on the right side of the market, especially if you're looking at something longer term like Landry Light in a, with a 50-week moving average. And again, it's the magnitude of what happens after the signal, not the signal in and of itself so what i would encourage you to do is pick your favorite trend pattern don't try to use everything in the world related to trend but pick your favorite trend pattern and it works really well when the market is trending <laughs> somebody emailed me the other day a video saying that this video says trend following doesn't work when the market isn't trending it, it reminded me of geico's obvious news scientists now say wearing more clothes in the winter makes you feel warmer we're talking with cold victim Kyle Peterson, or whatever his name is. <laughs> yeah, it was weird. I was kind of cold, and then I, I put on a sweater, and I, I wasn't cold anymore. So, yeah, everything works better with trend, and that's the secret. Now, I don't want to beat up on the Elliott Wave guys, although I may do an article and, and beat up on them a little bit. But quoting someone I, I know, and I can't say who it is. I don't want to throw anybody under the bus. But they basically said that they've never met a rich Elliottician. And I think it was Soros and a couple of other guys tried to get together and they spent millions of dollars. I forget the exact amount. That might be a slight exaggeration, but it was over a million trying to figure it out. And they didn't have any luck. Now, I did meet one rich Elliottician. At least he was rich for a while. He was a client of my service. And he was heavily into Elliott Wave, and the wave counts, lo and behold, agreed with the trend. And he did really, really well. Unfortunately, it ended badly because, in, ironically, I have the chart up here from 2009. At that low in 2009, he had a grand super cycle or whatever the hell they call it down and this market was getting ready to half in value again according to Elliott Wave. Well the wave count disagreed with the change and the trend. And I don't know exactly what happened to him. I haven't heard from him in a long, long time. But usually when someone begins fighting the trend and he was fighting the trend quite a bit, he was emailing me this the whole way up, telling me he was still bearish. But usually when someone disappears after that, it's it's not good. And, and that's a very unfortunate situation. But I kind of digressed into this. But the bottom line is everything works better with 
trend. So if we look at the cross back here in 2000, you could see that this little ribbon I programmed just this morning. And basically, I'm just saying, okay, if you've got a death cross and a downside is bearish, if you have a golden cross to the upside, meaning that the 50 cross is back above the 50-day moving average, it's bullish. Now, this looks amazing, doesn't it? Okay, you should get excited when you look at this. And I know I get excited when I look at something like this, but you've got to take it with a grain of salt and with context of that this was a fantastic trend to the downside followed by a fantastic trend to the upside. So again, what are we saying? Everything works better with trend. So if you take a look at like the daylight or Landry light as I now call it, you can see that we had Landry light for quite a bit of this trend lower below the 200 day moving average. We did have a couple of little kisses and a couple of, well, I guess a week or so, maybe a month where it was above that line, things were improving. And then of course it rolled right back over. And then finally you started getting some upside Landry light. Now, taking a longer term view of the market, going back to the early to late 90s, we had what? The mother of all trends. So this silly little indicator, the Death Cross and Golden Cross, worked pretty good way back then. Why? Well, the market was trending. Notice you do have that bearish period between 1994 and 1995. And the market really didn't come unglued. It just went mostly sideways back then, but it was pretty ugly, if memory serves. And then, of course, we had the mother of all trends from 1995 on. And it stayed bullish, turned bearish just for a little while during that 1998 correction. I forget what happened. But you could see that we did have that little bearish period, and then we had this huge bullish period. So driving the point home, everything works better with trend. Now, one thing I was thinking about lately, and I guess I've thought about this before, I just was reminding myself this morning as I woke up, as I always do, thinking about markets and writing about markets and dreaming about markets and so on and so forth. <laughs> is that the longer a trend indicator stays negative, the longer the trend will stay negative and vice versa. And it's just a thought process. But if you think about it, if you're gonna have downside Landry light for a long time, you're gonna start having it for a short time, correct? And then if that short term starts becoming a little bit longer, then maybe there's a possible trend developing. Now, if you just bought and sold every time you had Landry light, you would probably get whipsawed a lot. And not that we want to trade mechanically, but we do want to have some sort of objective edge here and there to kind of work in without discretionary trading. But if you possibly waited until you had multiple periods of Landry light one way or the other, then you would know that a possible trend is emerging. So if you take a look at this chart here, notice that you had upside Landry light. Now this indicator for those who are new to this simply counts the days of Landry light to the upside and does not count the magnitude, does not measure how far price is away from the moving average. But you can see it was green for a while and then it stayed green for the most part for a long, long, long time and obviously we had that great bull run from 1995 to 1999. Notice in the bear market, it started, it became red and it stayed red, red for a long, long time. This is a weekly, by the way, chart, and this is a weekly 50 week or 50 week moving average, I should say. And again, notice it stayed green, became green, and then stayed green for a long, long time. 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006, but notice it started turning red. Now, again, the great thing about that 2008 rollover was it was more of a process top, and so was 2000, by the way. As a general statement, this is something I picked up from Greg Morris, too, is that 
tops or generally a process and bottoms or generally an event. Now, often it seems quite the opposite, but as a general statement, now you got to be careful with that because 2002, 2003, that was kind of a process type of bottom as opposed to an event. But again, as we move forward in time, you can see a lot of red starts with a little bit of red. Now, every time you get a little red doesn't mean that the sky is falling, right? So we had some, a few little, if you want to call them whip saws in between. And some of these were fairly ugly. I remember 2015, 16 sell off. That was a, that was a tough time in the market. The buy and hold people got paid on that and the traders got punished a little bit because it was a little choppy. There was some whipsaw. But overall, it was fairly ugly, especially early 2016 when the market began to implode a little bit. So it sure did look like the beginning of the end then, and then the market turned around and decided to go right back up. Now we had a little red last, I say last, It's I keep forgetting this, 2018, time has flied so fast, I keep saying last December, but it's December before last. In 2018, we had some red, and that was a pretty ugly spill, as I've said ad nauseum, bumped into a guy on the streets, he said he was a bit of a trader. I did not tell him that so am I. And I said, oh, you know, that's interesting. And he says, I'm glad I held on through December. And I wish I would have bought more. He told me that in January. Well, now we could be in one of those periods of time where the market has rewarded bad behavior once again, because I'd be willing to bet that same gentleman has held on through that 30% slide and I'd be willing to bet that he probably bought more, at least if he's going to follow his little system that he said last time. Anyway, before I digress too too far, my point is that we now have a little red, obviously, and the longer it stays red, the more pressure will be put on the market. So this is just kind of a theory of mine, but the more the longer it stays red, the longer the indicator stays negative, the longer price stays at fairly low levels, the more pressure it will put on people. So from a psychological perspective, and this might make a little bit more sense once we zoom the chart in a little bit, if you think about the market participants, and remember, we're trading traders, not markets, and we're also trading investors too, if you think about that, and that's that might be fodder for some research there too. But Along the lines of the investors, I've got the one friend I've been talking about ad nauseum that was excited, excited because he was making 1K per day in his 401K. And then I had the family member who recently had a very serious injury and may not ever return to work. And is also probably about five years out from retirement. And she began to see her retirement evaporate about a year ago. She had a major firm put it into conservative investments, and she thought it would be conservative. And all of these investments, for the most part, had a very positive correlation to the overall market. In theory, that should not have happened, but I suppose the money manager never went through a bear market where everything, including the baby, gets thrown out with the bathwater. And that's what she experienced. So in helping her, as this market retraced, I helped her exit some shares and lighten up and sell down to the sleeping level. In fact, we moved her, I think, pretty much nearly all in cash other than some gold. Anyway, long story endless, I think the longer it stays down here, the more time it gives people to think about actually getting out, at least those who are likely to get out because they need the money. One of my wife's friends called me recently and I'm telling her the same thing I tell everyone else, sell down to the sleeping level, okay? She's, I guess my age, um, I was gonna say a little older, but <laughs> I'm a little older. And you know, at this age of your life, unless you're a trader like Big Dave, you gotta start thinking about becoming a little bit more conservative or just have it in the back of your mind. At, at the least, you have to have a plan, okay? You know, one of the things I thought about this morning is markets go up and markets go down. I know, duh. All you have to do is 
figure out what you're going to do when markets go up and figure out what you're going to do when markets go down. I know I would, I would do a mic drop, but last time I did that, I broke a mic. But think about that though. If if one of your friends or relatives and everybody here that's live, I know is fairly accomplished traders. I know one guy, he's so young. I don't think he's, he's been, he hadn't been on earth as long as many of the other guys have been trading. But most of you guys here are fairly accomplished. You guys are watching live. And that might be a good thing to to tell these people when you start fielding these phone calls from your friends and relatives. It's like, well, markets go up and markets go down. Figure out what you're going to do when they go up and then figure out what you're going to do when they go down. And I actually, before all this mess got started, I wish I would have rushed it a little bit or just, you know, my follow through is abysmal sometimes, especially when everything started to come unglued now. But I began working on a piece, trading for investors, I think was the working title of it. It was based on my wife's friend who was a bit concerned when she just put all her money into this black hole with this money manager several months ago. And, you know, I started noodling her a little bit, asking questions like, or she was noodling me, asking me questions. And I'm like, well, you know, what what is this plan when things go sour? And, you know, she would come back to me and say, well, he says we don't want to get shaken out. We don't want to get knocked out of our investment. And I'm like, okay, really? You know, every asset class at some point in its lifetime will lose half of its value. And if you don't believe me, look at the chart. Stocks in my short period of investing this is my third bear market, and I've seen them lose half of their value twice. So the NASDAQ lose, what is it, 80% or 77%? I add a percent every every week when I do these presentations. So last week I, I posed a question, is some lag okay? And I, th I think, yeah, because it might prevent you from chasing your own tail. If you're in and out, in and out, in and out, like the rat going for his cocaine, you're going to get chewed up in the markets and lose a lot of money. And a little lag will give the market time to readjust. So sometimes by that, I just mean it might just be a little bit of a correction. Maybe that little go, on, go in and look back to those charts that I just showed where you've got serious downside Landry lag and you have a little kiss of the moving average. It may be just a little bit of upside Landry light, and then that big downtrend resumes again. So maybe as part of your system, so to speak, or your analysis, it's like, okay, we now have some upside Landry light. Let's just see if it can continue to follow through for a while, and that might stop you from making some sort of drastic change. Now, the bottom line is, keep this in mind. I'm getting ready to show you some charts that I'm short. And um, I hope the mic wasn't on earlier, but I literally dropped a pretty big, <laughs> a pretty big F bomb. So I do have a plan in place, and I will get out of the way. I'm not going to be obstinate, but we'll get that. We'll get there too. And as I said last week, a little lag will help avoid bad things. And it's like by not selling, not chasing your own tail and waiting for a little bit of confirmation with some of these signals before getting in. Yes, you'll be a little late to get out, a little late to get in when the tide turns. But the bottom line is you'll, in general, stay out of trouble in the markets by using a little bit of market timing to help you out. Now, everything I do is set up base, so I go set up by set up, but I do keep the backdrop of the market, obviously, in mind. So we have things like the 10% TFM system, which has a little bit of a whipsaw filter in there. So you also have to close below the 50-week moving average, which to my amazement, that signal, that weekly signal triggered before some of the daily signals, such as bow ties, caught up. But that does put a little lag into the system. But once you do get the signal, as I've said earlier, bad things do occur below the 10% line now one thing i've been thinking about is will something like the bow ties keep you from becoming bullish 
too early. We're in this big old fat retrace rally. And as you can see, the bow tie moving averages, 10 simple, 20 exponential, 30 exponential, have turned back up. When they cross over a short period of time, you get a little pullback, like we did back in March. Your sell signal was right here on this day here. That was the daily signal. In fact, we even got the, the weekly TFM system, which is based on the weekly charts, actually triggered back here. But the bow ties took about a week to trigger and they triggered here. And now we're getting ready to get a bow tie back up. Now, as I said in prior presentations, even though it's three years, three year lows we just made, I'd like to see a much lower low from a tech from a technical perspective. I don't necessarily want the market to go down, but I'm just saying, well, I wouldn't mind if it went down for a week or so. <laughs> but from a technical perspective, uh, perspective or technician's perspective, I prefer bow ties coming off of major, major lows, like 13 year lows that we saw in 2003. And I think it was five year plus lows in 2000, 2001, when the market finally bottomed out from the 2000 bear market. But we are getting a possible daily signal soon. And you can see that the 10 has crossed up above the 20 and the 20 exponential hasn't crossed the 30 yet, but it is, or it has, I should say, turned back up and so has the 30. Now, this is something that, as I've said before, and I think I put this into trading full circle, and it's certainly in the members area too, and I talk about it quite often. When close, when the close crosses above the exponential moving average, it could be a 10 day exponential, or a 100 day exponential or a 1000 day exponential. The way the math works, the exponential moving average will turn up. So if you look at the 30 day exponential moving average, it's a little hard to see. But if you look closely, you can see that the moving average has turned up. So as long as price stays above these exponential moving averages, they will come together and possibly bow tie to the upside. Now, many years ago, I worked with a hedge fund for probably a decade and a half as a consultant. And one of the things that I would do as the lead technician is we had, I think it was a 30-day moving average, if memory serves. And he had an affinity for that moving average. So what I would do is I would make predictions as to where that average would be looking forward. And I would look at things like the drop-off effect. So if we look at the, we go back in time 20 days, this chart doesn't go back 30 days, just goes back 20 something days. But if you count back 20 days, that price is going to drop off and then you're going to add in some lower prices, but eventually you're going to start dropping off those really low prices and then you start adding in some much higher prices. So that action in and of itself is going to force those moving averages to continue higher. So for now, in order to get a bow tie, you, the market would probably have to stay above let's just say 2750 round numbers, because if it does begin to drop back below those moving averages and stays below them for a while, especially the exponential, but the 10 day simple will catch up pretty quickly, those moving averages will turn down. So I'm just trying to look ahead and predict what's going to happen with this bow tie indicators. Now, always remember price is king, but like I used to do back with the hedge fund is I did look at the relationships just to see how they were gonna end up over the next week or so, so we can make some plans based on that. And you can't necessarily predict the markets on that, but it does give you an idea as to where everything is headed. And you can anticipate a possible buy signal. Doesn't mean you wanna buy early, you wanna wait for the signal, but it's a way to kind of wrap your head around the fact that you could get a signal soon or not. Now, Larry Williams did something interesting and my arrows are drawn wrong, but 
we had that big sell-off, uh, hard sell-off, obviously, from late February to March 23rd. And we have begun to retrace back up. Now, I haven't really had time to do a lot of thinking or a lot of research on it, but I, I agree with Larry on the surface. I, there's a few things I could pick apart with it until I get in and do my actual research, just kind of like on a, just kind of glancing at everything and going back in history. But his point was, before I digress too far, that bull markets end after a 50% retracement now the the things i was picking apart not to digress too far is just that you don't know the bottom until the bottom is actually in okay so if this market rolls back over even though it's retraced 50 percent then you would end up with a new 50 percent retracement but where i agree with larry is in order for a market to start going up it has to what it has to start going up Okay, I know. <laughs> so his measure of 50% of the downtrend is as good as any. Landry Light is a good thing. Daily and weekly bow ties are a good thing. Just whatever performance metric you want to use, or even a few of them, just don't get analysis paralysis, but mostly pay attention to price action will help to keep you on the right side of the market. Now, as I've said before, the 10% line and 10% line is the 50 week closing high less 10%. And that's that green line illustrated below. And the point that I've been making, and I think it's Baleo and Gayard that talked about how bad things happen below the 200 day moving average. And as a corollary, I said, well, bad things happen below the 10% line. And if you look at this blue histogram up top, that black line is right at 10%. And you can see, as long as the market doesn't drop more than 10%, basis the S&P 500, okay, things generally do fairly well. It's when you go more than 10% above that line that things can come unglued or bad things could happen, quoting Mr. Baleo and Mr. Gare. So you could see that the bear market ended in both cases when we got above the 10% line, okay? So Larry Williams' point is that, okay, we get about the 50% retracement, usually, or it appears that bear markets end when that happens. Well, in order for a bear market to end, as a general statement, you have to get above that 10% line. Now, here's the problem. The problem is that in order for that 10% line, as you'll see in a few slides, to begin to drop, we're gonna have to go another 40 weeks into the future before that line will begin dropping to catch up with price. Those nice long downtrends, it begins to catch up with price, and it really does help you to get in fairly close to the bottom. So I think Larry's point is that, as I said earlier, in order for a market to bottom, it has to start getting better. So use whatever you wanna use, a moving average crossing. Just be careful not to use too long a moving average just because you will have a lot, a lot of lag. Use price in and of itself. How far are we off the lows? Which I'll show you in one second, it could be another telling thing, and of course, Landry light and bow ties. So if we zoom in on a 10% line, and again, the top histogram is just how far away we are from closing highs, okay? So you could see in this last little slide that we had down here measured to the 50 week closing high, which would be right there, that was a 30 something percent drop, really significant over a short period of time. And this is a weekly chart. And again, this is the 2019 slide back here, which is a pretty serious slide. I think you had to get out the way. Or 2018, I always get them confused. And again, that was the one where the man on the street was like, oh, I just held through that. I wish I'd have bought more. Well, that'll work until it don't. 
So the point I was saying earlier, just a few minutes ago, is it's going to take around 40 weeks. We're about nine weeks into the sell-off. And since it's a 50-week high, it's going to get it's going to stay stuck around 3,400, less 10%. And that green line is not going to drop for a while. So one or two things is going to happen. Either the market's going to have to trade forward for 40 weeks below the line, and the line will start dropping down, or obviously we'll have to rally above that line, above 3,100 or so. By the way, as I said last week and week before, and then all my bear market updates, people were like, Dave, where exactly are you going to get bullish? I was like, well, you know, it's kind of like a Justice Potter Stewart thing. I'll know it when I see it. My big concern is that we could have a big old fat retrace, and you could use that 10% line if you want as an example, and the market could still be in trouble. Now, obviously, that would be above that 50% retrace that Larry Williams talked about. So maybe that would be a part where a point where I might have to rethink this concern about the market. But for now, until I start getting signals such as a daily bow tie signal and then possibly some of these other signals, I'm not gonna get too excited about the upside just yet. Now, if I see a long setup that I just absolutely love, I'm going to take it. But I just haven't seen a whole lot of those lately. Now, one thing I woke up thinking about this morning is obviously the 50 week closing high, less 10%, which I have illustrated with the green line here. So that's just basically 10% off the closing high, right? That's it. That's all it is. It's like 0.9 times the highest high value of the close for 50 days. It's a little one line formula. So that's going to take another 40 weeks to catch up to start catching up the price. What would happen if we looked at performance off of the lows? So this is the performance relative to the 50 week closing high. What if we looked at the performance relative to the 50 week closing low? Now I literally programmed this about 10 minutes ago and I really hadn't had a whole lot of time to look at it, but it is kind of cool. You could see we are definitely more than 10% off the lows. The other thing I was kind of looking at is what would happen if you considered an up move when you had Landry light above that 50 week low plus 10. So again, I'm seeing this, you're seeing this about 10 minutes well, plus whatever I've yapped so far, <laughs> another 40 minutes. So 50 minutes ago, I was literally programming this. So just kind of something that might be worth playing with. And I haven't really fleshed it out just yet. But I do think it's kind of interesting because it will catch up the price quicker in a big spill like this. So maybe this is something to flesh out further. How does the 10% system work in other time frames? A daily time frame would likely trigger sooner. Um in this particular case i don't know that it would have because i don't think it would have because the it actually the thing that kind of amazed me about this slide donald was that the tfm 10 percent system which is the weekly charting system or based on weekly charts i should say triggered before a lot of the daily signals but yeah, if you go down to a daily chart or a five minute chart, okay, which I did play around with quite a bit for a while, and there are some issues there that I, that I probably need to flesh out with you guys in the Facebook group on that, that I discovered initially, it looked like it was, it was kind of promising. But anyway, by dropping your time frame, you're going to get likely more and more signals. But in this particular case, ironically, I don't think you would have I don't think it would have made a difference, but I'll I'll definitely look into that and see what happens. So the 50 week low line plus 10 or performance relative to the lows, there might be some fodder for research there. So stay tuned for that. If you guys want to take the ball and run with that, that would be fantastic. And that's kind of the that's kind of the one of the things I didn't 
necessarily intend from day one with the Facebook group, but that has worked out nicely, is that you guys have come up with your own research in there and have been publishing, and that's kind of a cool thing. Uh, when I started my members area, the gold membership is what I call it, my intent was to start a Facebook group just so I can interact with you guys and we can maybe interact with each other a little bit. And I didn't think about it becoming the mastermind group. I thought that would be like version 2.0 where we had these accomplished traders all together, extra set of eyeballs looking at the charts. We throw the ideas around what we're seeing and learn from each other both good and bad, obviously, trials and tribulations. And to my surprise, that Facebook group quickly morphed into that. It's taken on a life of its own, and I'm, I could not be happier. Now, my before I got sidetracked doing all this messing around with the 10% system and looking into Larry's research and all these other things this morning, my initial intention was to talk about the four more, most dangerous words on Wall Street, and that's confusing the issue with facts. What is is, right? So I'm sure now you've seen this meme. I call them May Mays, and it just kind of pisses my daughter off. <laughs> but this was the, the May May that was going around the internet. Dow's best week since 1998. More than 16 million Americans have lost their jobs in three weeks. So if you confuse the issue with facts, this really, really negative news should not have the market going higher. Now, here are four more of the most dangerous words, and these are the original four dangerous words you've probably seen bloggers write about, at least those who actually trade using technical analysis and that is it's different this time and the corollary to that the other four words or if it weren't for and then insert a reason that is likely attributed to the market going down so a lot of people are saying that this sell-off is just, and I don't want to say the actual name of it because YouTube is shutting down videos, I guess, fear of fear mongering, for lack of a better word, by talking about that certain ailment that is going around. So, but a lot of people I've seen say, well, this sell-off is just that Mexican deer virus. I'm like, okay. Well, that play was pretty darn good. If it weren't for the shooting, if it weren't for the shooting, the play was pretty darn good, as Mary Todd Lincoln once said. Now, I just told you not to confuse the issue with facts. And the thing about having an educational business is it forces me to do a lot of introspection. And believe me, putting everything out there for everybody to see, warts and all, because I don't do anything in hindsight. Now, some of the stuff, obviously, if you want to, if you want signals, you have to pay for them. But I made a pact with myself not to talk about anything unless I recommended it first. And I work hard to do that unless we have the mother of all examples and something and I missed it. And I'm kicking myself in the ass for it. But yeah, the question is, is Big Dave confusing the issue with facts? So let's take a look at some of my charts. So here's KRC, which is a REIT. And I think it was Dakota talking about the REITs in the Facebook group. And I agree with him. It's like, why? would REITs be going up? And to confuse the issue with facts, who needs space to run a closed business, right? The United States is shut down. Why do you need office space? 
Now, here we have a brick and mortar retailer, and that argument came up this morning. Like, why in the world would a brick and mortar retailer be going up given the situation in the overall market? Now, by the way, keep in mind, this was a recommendation about a week or so ago, and I do have I do have a stop in place just in case, obviously. So I'm not going to throw caution to the wind, and I'm going to discuss that a little bit in a few minutes. But this was a really nice setup, and so far it hasn't worked so hot. And unfortunately, on a mechanical basis, it did stop out. So let me get the pin working here. So we had this really nice sell-off, okay? And then we had this deep pullback, which was really beautiful. And then we sold short, I forget exactly where, probably somewhere in here, and so far it's retraced back up. Now I have a stop in here somewhere around 51 or so. I forget the exact stop, but I'm just exercising a little discretion and hope, I know I should never say use the word hope, but hopefully it'll roll right back over. And then I'm not confusing the issue with facts, but deep down I'm thinking as my, <laughs> why, <laughs> why would this stock rally given the nature of the overall market and, or more specifically given the nature of this situation we're going through with that mexican logger disease uber same thing who in the hell is riding in an uber now i did accidentally hear a little news that uber was delivering food but so is Grubhub and whatever else, DoorDash and whatever else is out there. And then every restaurant in the world is now delivering to A, keep their people people busy and B, keep the doors open. <laughs> but yeah, I'm confusing the issue with facts a little bit. And this was once again, a deep retrace, sold off a little bit. In hindsight, my stop was a little tight on this one, the mechanical stop at least, what I recommend in the service. And so far I'm still short, but that might change soon along the lines of maybe continuing to confuse the issue with facts, who's buying a fake Chinese educational company? This one triggered a short a couple of days ago as a beautiful bow tie to the downside. You can see those moving averages came together really nicely, began to spread out, a little bit of a pullback. This is nearly as textbook as you get. I guess that moving average could have been a little bit tighter. But for all intents and purposes, this is a really good looking setup. Inverted cup and handle, if you want to call it that. First thrust, sort of, if you want to call it that. Overhead supply, it just fit or just checked off all the boxes. And the news did come out, I think, after our shorts triggered. But it's true. It's like this thing is, it was down a little this morning, but now it's starting to go up a little bit. I'm like, who in the world would buy a fake Chinese educational? company okay or who would buy any company given the nature of what's going on with that mexican loroga disease how's that speaking of disease people are dying in the world in the market at least recently is going up two million people confirmed unfortunately over a or nearly 150,000 deaths, which is very sad. So confusing the issue with facts, I do believe that the market will bottom when there's a blood in the streets. And that's an old Wall Street adage, buy when there's blood in the streets, right? Because that's usually when the market's bottom. I do remember when the S&P hit 666, which is a bit of an omen, obviously, back in 2002, 2003, I forget, when did it hit 666? I remember thinking that that was the end of the world, and that turned out to be the exact bottom. So I just don't know if there's enough blood in the streets yet, okay? These are the number of cases worldwide, 2009. Yeah, I think so. I think you're right, Donald. Thank you. And that line looks pretty steep to me, okay? So I know I'm confusing the issue with facts. The bottom line is we do need to focus on price and it's hard not to have this in the back of your head. 
and what is is, and you want to have stops in place just in case. And you might want to write that down. Now, here's some random closing thoughts here. As I preach, price is king. If I have to throw in the towel, I will on my shorts, even though I know deep down I'm probably going to regret it. Okay. But I have to remember that he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. So this is kind of the warts and all part of the methodology. The beautiful part was when we were in that nice uptrend and we were buying stocks and trading IPOs and we we're all high-fiving each other and kissing each other. I guess we can't high-five and kissing each other, kissing each, each other anymore. So I guess we elbow bump each other or whatever from, or get a stick and poke each other from 10 feet away. <laughs> I have a little, uh, one of those trash picker uppers. I'll put a beer on one. And I was handing my neighbor a beer across the fence. That was kind of cool. Anyway, so price is king. If I have to throw in the towel, I will, even though I know I'll probably regret it. He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. Anyway, uh, getting back to the, I got, I lost my train of thought there for a second. I, sometimes I call it trend of thoughts, which I think would be kind of a cool column name or something. But we were doing really well on the upside, and then we gave up a bunch of open profits. Fortunately, we took profits along the way and trailed stops higher, and that was okay. So a lot of that that we lost in the slide was open profits. And we did have a short or two on, so that kind of helped a little bit to mitigate the damage. But then we started printing money on the short side, and it was kind of a beautiful thing. And usually, when the market makes such an abrupt change, the methodology being trend following is a little slow to catch up. And you don't make back your money that fast and then some, but it did. But now, even though we've taken some partial profits along the way, that retrace rally back up is beginning to do a little damage, obviously, to those positions. And if we get stopped out, so be it. And that's, that's the part that sucks with trend following. You know, it's, these gurus make my blood boil. I and, and they get recommended to me. And what happens, too, is because... My YouTube channel is becoming more popular, and I'm also part of like stock charts and all. All these gurus, so to speak, advertise on my channel and advertise on stock charts channel, and to a point where it's a little bit obnoxious. Like I'm, I know, like on my stock charts videos have so many ads in them, it's it's kind of frustrating. I need to talk to those guys and see if we can figure out a way to turn that down a little bit. But anyway, before I digress too far, there's all these guys that come on and make it look like it's really really easy. And it's not. Yeah, it's really, really easy if you're a trend follower and the market's going up. It's really, really easy if you're a trend follower after you get beat up a little bit and the market starts going down. And it's really easy to trend follower if the market starts going up, but persist in going up. In other words, it has to trend. So I try to show you things warts and all, try to be realistic. I don't want to be in the customer replacement business like these guys are, fleecing people and spending millions of dollars in YouTube ads and just it becomes a revolving door, get the people's money and then move on to the next victim. I'd much rather grow a tribe of traders, so to speak. I think that's kind of borrowing a term from Ed Zakota, but a bunch of traders, whatever you want to call us. And we stick together for a long time and do really well together. Now, unless you're Bill Clinton, what is, is... If the market is going up, then it is going up. Yeah, somebody's saying that uh, some guy keeps popping up and trying to sell his worthless system. I see him on my videos too. Well, that's, you know, I think I get a penny or something every time those ghost pop guys pop up. So just, you know, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. I think maybe one out of a thousand of those guys is probably doing okay. It's, I don't know how you would sift through the all the hay to get to the needle, though. But, yeah, most of them, you know, I saw one guy yesterday who claims to make $500,000 every six months or so <laughs> on a $50,000 account. So, I mean, you know, here's the deal. I love you guys, but if I could turn $50,000 into $500,000, even over a year, you might not, and rinse and repeat, of course, then you might not see my fat ass again. For a while uh this is leftover a little bit from last week i think 
it's kind of a dangerous time just to jump in, not so much because of the news, but we are kind of overbought and possibly only in a retrace rally. So let's not be obstinate and fight the trend, okay, if this is a new trend developing, but it's a little dangerous to jump in midstream here just in case this is a retrace rally. My big fear, and I've got to be careful because I've been, I, I, I don't like to label myself and I've labeled myself bearish, okay? But my big fear, just as a general statement, forget about trading for 10 seconds, is that the market begins to sell off and the widows and orphans and people that are nearing retirement and all these other people who need to get out of the market who are still on the hook, begin to all rush for the door at the same time. And God forbid, if some really bad news came in, even though there's blood in the streets, I can't imagine worse news, but if some really bad news came in, everybody could run for the door at the same time. So that's got me a little bit concerned about this market. Now, one thing I'm kind of backing into today, and it's something, I, it's something I've thought about prior to this morning, but this morning I was thinking about it a lot, as I said earlier, is the longer things stay bad, the longer things stay bad. In other words, as long as the market stays relatively weak as to where it was, the more time people have to think about whether or not they need to get out of the market, the more time people have to think about their retirement, which is one day closer, each day the market remains at a certain level. So, Will this retrace rally run out of a little gas? And I think it can, but that's a little bit esoteric. You can't time the market on the, even if it was a fact, on the fact that the more time it stays low, the eventually the time will start to wear on these people who, who need to exit. If it goes right back up, it's a big do-over, then nobody has time to react. So it's just something to think about. Now, I made a reference to Abe Lincoln's wife a little while ago. He did have a wonderful quote. The great thing about the future is that it comes at you one day at a time. Amen. He could have been a really good trader. So don't get too bullish. Don't get too bearish. Do follow along. One thing that's been proven, and I think that's part of the problem that they're worried about. They're worried that all of us not being social with other people because of this situation that's going on with this Mexican lager cold or whatever you want to call it, that we could run into some problems that are worse than the Mexican lager cold in and of itself, which I can't imagine. But unfortunately, there could be some serious problems that would happen because we're not made to be lonely. We're made to be social creatures. A buddy of mine stopped by a while back, about a week ago, he brought his own little table, he set up in the front yard, he brought his own beer, and he drank a beer with us for about 20 minutes or so, and then he got in his Jeep and went home. And it was just like, it was just a wonderful thing, and it was really, really, really nice. Any other time he'd show up, be like, hey, how's it going? Yeah, whatever. But, you know, it was like, wow, talking to another person, seeing another person was really, really a nice thing, even though we were 10, 20 feet away and outside, but that was fine. The point I'm trying to make is we're not made to be alone, and I've been kind of lonely here and there as a trader over the years, and as my wife had pointed out to me, and, and I fully agree and had the same thoughts, the Facebook group has been a godsend for me to be able to interact with all you guys, and I appreciate you guys being there. So if you or a gold member of DaveLander.com. I do that to keep the riffraff out. I will, you'll probably get an email from me encouraging you to join a group and I'll prove you right away. And then you could interact with other traders and myself, ask for help, and then I'll put out signs and signals on things as I see them. And then there's some other little stuff we're doing for fun, such as open a gap reversal trading and the $4 million challenge. All right, let's open it up for individual questions. Let's open it up for individual stocks or not individual questions, just questions and stocks. All right, Ed, here we go. I'm short Z negative 
hourly bow tie and housing stock do well here. Okay, we can talk about the actual stock, I suppose. But uh, thanks for thanks for uh, being courteous for my service people, which you are one of, obviously. Okay, let's do this. Let's uh, keep the stock picks coming. And what I'm going to do is let me go through the market a little bit, maybe touch on a few things that I haven't talked about just yet, although I think we pretty much covered everything on the cover. All right, NASDAQ Composite, since we're here. Okay, NASDAQ Composite, decent day. Look at that, up a percent and a half. Oh, off its best levels. Oh, there we go. I thought it was doing worse than that. But still, up uh, a little bit more than a half percent nonetheless. This is the 50-day moving average. And as you can see, we're now back above it. Let's take a look at those bow ties. So everything I just said a few minutes ago, in order for this market to bow tie, what's going to have to happen? Well, it's going to have to stay above 8,000 round numbers. And so far, we're above 8,000. So we could bow tie fairly soon. This last signal was a really beautiful signal. Now, remember, when we're coming off of all-time highs like we were, that's when these transitional setups, the bow ties, the first thrust, et cetera, are really important. But look how beautiful and almost textbook in nature that bow tie is, okay? We had the 10-day simple above the 20-day exponential and the 20-day exponential above the 30-day exponential. They came together really quick and spread out, given the appearance of a bow tie. And then you had a pullback here, okay? And the aggressive entry would have been on this day here, I think March 4th, if memory serves. And no, this is not in hindsight. I called this signal as we saw it. For those watching the recording of this, somebody had said, all my stuff is in hindsight. No, none of my stuff is in hindsight. I will call them as I see them. And then now you can see that we are coming together fairly quickly. We could bow tie really, really soon. Now, let's back the chart out a little bit. So in this particular case, I think the S&P is at three-year lows, but the NASDAQ is only at about one year or so lows coming off of this bow tie. I prefer multi-year lows with the bow tie, but sometimes even if you don't get multi-year lows, like 2019, you can see you go back, I keep calling it 2019, 2018, you can go back, yeah, it was about a year and a half. And then this bow tie here did work out fairly well. And by the way, this down bow tie here off of all time highs was fairly significant too. Let's just take a look at that real quick while we're talking bow ties. So you could see the back in 2018, the market made the bow tie down. Okay, so all-time highs right here. Moving averages come together, spread out. You got your little pullback here. So sell short would have been on this right in here somewhere. And it was a bit of a bumpy ride, but that was a pretty significant drop, okay? Significant enough. And let's go ahead and take a look at, just for S and Gs. Let's see how much that was. Yeah, that's a 20% drop, wow. That can't be right, can it? Did the market drop 20% for that bow tie? 19%. We'll have to go back in and look at that, but that's kind of interesting. I didn't realize that was that big of a drop, but that's why I keep saying that drop in 2019, 2018, actually, was a lot uglier than it might look. All right, let's take a look at the S&P 500. One thing I'm looking at here is this little pivot point right there. And to those who are familiar with a lot of my patterns, and if you're just watching this live, if you go to davelandry.com slash, I think it's free dash book, you can get all three of my books for free. And, you know, just get to know me first, okay? Obviously, don't uh, spend a fortune on, on something and then try to figure out who the hell I am, like some of those gurus are trying to get you to do. But get to know me first. Watch a few of these weekend charts and then read those three books. Anyway, the point is, in there, in one of them, the second book, I think, I talked about the witch hat pattern. So witch hat something I like more on the short side than the long side. Not a huge fan of the long side, even though I do initially, initially showed quite a few long side examples. I just like it better now on the short side. So we've got this big old fat retracement. Now, we've got quite a few days in this retracement, which, which 
doesn't fit the exact methodology, but if you take a look at, and I know it's a dangerous game, like a two-day chart or a three-day chart, the pattern of the deep retracement or the pullback becomes a little bit more obvious. So if we get past this little peak in the witch hat, which is 2882, then I would say, okay, well, we've gotten past that little bit of resistance, also a little bit of a gap in there to close. So certainly the market be improving. And as I said earlier, as long as we stay in this 2800 range, these moving averages will begin to come together and we could form the possible bow tie. Okay, not that you want to anticipate the signal, but it's nice to know where you are. Russell 2000, little bit of a different story, okay? It's down 2% of change today, obviously the worst. I think Mike Peterson was pointing out it led us lower, and so far it's leading us lower. Maybe we'll keep an eye on it to see if it eventually begins to lead us out of this mess. But so far, not so good. You can see, and this is a great teachable moment here. Remember what I said about the moving averages, specifically the exponential ones? So this is really cool. I'm just kind of seeing this on the fly. That's a great thing about teaching. You can see the price here cross above the 20-day exponential moving average. And you can see that the 10-day simple moving average is headed higher. Well, that makes sense because let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. You average out those prices and it turns up, it comes to an average right in here, obviously, and that it is turned up. Now What's interesting is this Russell has begun to sell off a little bit, okay? So what happened with the 30-day moving average? Well, what's the rule we learned from Greg? As soon as close goes below the moving average, the moving average turns down. Now take a look at the 20-day moving average, okay? As soon as close goes below the exponential moving average, remember this is a 30 EMA, and I know the guy, you guys that are here, your eyes are glazing over, but just keep in mind that not everybody knows bow ties and moving averages. And this is a 10 simple. So notice that the 10 is still headed higher, okay? So there is a little lag, and that's, that's intentionally built in because I like the way the 10 day acts around these longer term moving averages. But notice that the 20 has already turned back down, and the 30 has already turned back down. Why? Well, price, at least where we are at this moment in time, is below those two moving averages. So kind of interesting that the Russell 2000 still looks like it's in a lot of trouble, and certainly more trouble than the S&P and the NASDAQ, which for now, or a little bit longer term, are working their way higher fairly nicely. So Russell, not as good as the rest of the guys. As we go through the sectors, you'll see that most look like the overall market itself. Most are headed in downtrends. Now, I don't want to be not be a trend follower, okay? But I think these energies, because they've been beating beaten up the most, will probably be the first to possibly bottom, at least longer term. And that's where bow ties are gonna really come in handy. So in case I get hit by a beer truck, if these energies return down to the old lows and base out for a while, start watching for bow ties there to the upside. We could have the mother of all opportunities. Now, that might take a little while to unfold. I think it's gonna be more of a process, okay? But it's kind of interesting, by the way, I got into a conversation with someone on Facebook who's a little bit newer to trading, and they were wanting to bargain hunt in the USO. And it does look like it's at low levels, right? But the problem with something like a derivative of a derivative of a derivative, in this case, okay, so oil would be the underlying contract, the futures contract would be the derivative, it derives its value from the oil, and then this ETF derives its value from the future. Did you head hurt yet? The problem with all that is 
because this is based on futures, there's something called contango, which means that futures prices as a general statement tend to decay. Of course, you know, market could sometimes go backwardation, but that's a whole nother conversation. But as a general statement, something in the future because of interest rates and storage and all these other reasons is more expensive than something today. But as that contract gets closer to expiration, and this derivative of a derivative of a derivative, easy for me to say, rolls out to the next contract, you're going to have this built-in decay. So it's going to, so to speak, want to go lower as a general statement. So it's not necessarily a value down here at $4 a share. Yeah, I'd love to just buy it and, and, and close my eyes and forget about it and then have it rally back up to 13. That would be what, 300%, a 40% rally. That'd be fantastic. I just think the world's a little bit more complex place than that. I saw somebody out there that's toying with the idea of selling puts and, and that would help with your decay, but then you get a lot of moving pieces and it could get really dangerous really quick. So as a general statement, I would pass. Now, if this does bow tie and makes a really nice daily bow tie, I will buy it, okay? Not beyond a question of doubt, I will buy it, okay? Not a big fan of holding it longer term for those aforementioned reasons, but this thing bow ties and begins flying higher out of a bow tie, that could be a wonderful trade. Now, before I forget, let's take a look at gold. Gold's been pretty impressive, but keep in mind that my methodology is not a be-all, end-all. It's not, it doesn't work in every market in the world. What I do, because a lot of times people like, uh, will look at a stock and they'll stock it, they'll stock it, they'll stock it, and they keep asking me questions about one stock over and over and over and over and over. And I'm like, look, there's about $4,000, $4,000 stocks in my tradable universe. I might look as look at as many as as many as two thousand of those every day, sometimes more. It was three thousand recently, and the scan's coming up. And out of those three thousand, I'll pick the one or two, if any, okay, to trade. So rather than just stock a market, stock a market, stock a market, stock all markets and look at all markets, and then find the best pattern, and not be too focused on one particular stock. So. In this particular case, the point I'm trying to make is my methodology is not be all end all. It would not have told you to buy gold, at least not yet. Okay. And then the problem is gold would have to pull back. If it pulls back, now we're back below this breakout range and it just flat out wouldn't work. So, not a be all end all methodology, but the best I've found in many, many years of searching. So, gold stocks, like the commodity, have broken out, but no real follow through just yet past these prior peaks. Believe me, I'm looking at them. I would love to buy some gold stocks, okay? Or any stocks for that matter that are set up. There's just not a whole lot of stocks that are set up out there. Silver is lagging behind gold. The problem with silver is it has, these are silver stocks, by the way, it has some overhead supply to deal with, okay? Some stocks look, still look really, really ugly. I am bearish on the insurance companies. I have puts in ACGL, full disclosure. AIZ was one I recommended for people looking to do something yesterday or day before, I forget, a couple of days ago. And so far, it looks like it's trying to make a new leg lower. Okay. I think stocks in general are still in trouble. And I think these insurance stocks, especially, are in trouble. Let's take a look at the REITs. Okay. Why would REITs be going up? I don't know. But it looks like they're going down, at least for now. So it looks like thrust pullback and then a new thrust lower back to old lows. By the way, I still think the overall market will do that, but hey, so far the market doesn't care what I think. Drugs have been in a really impressive run. I wouldn't rush out and buy something like drugs because they are just so overbought. They went straight up in here. Very dangerous time to buy, a little bit overhead supply to deal with. Biotechnology, same sort of action there too. On an individual issue basis, some biotechs are breaking out. But the problem is they're all over the place and super, super, super volatile. So I wouldn't rush out and buy biotech unless I have the mother of all setups. And in all these stocks and sectors, unless I have the mother of all setups, or if I have the mother of all setups on the upside and the market is still looking ugly, I'll go ahead and take it, okay? Because everything I do is setup based. But anything less, I'm skeptical of. And occasionally something like Zoom I just have to let it go by, go without me, take off without me, 
because it's not worth the risk. So there's retail doing really, really well. It's just really hard to sustain these V-shaped recoveries at high levels. Go in and watch last week's, we could charge for a lot more on that. And as you go through these sectors, most look like the market itself and most have only pulled back at best with this, with a few exceptions of obviously retail and drugs overall. Software, so far that looks like a deep retracement to me, but I'm not gonna be obstinate. You can see we could bow tie up soon here. So let's just see what happens one day at a time. Stop me if you heard that before. Let's take a look at bonds. Bonds pretty impressive in here. They banged out all time highs, imploded, and then now they've come back strongly. That made for some pretty serious and ugly portfolios that were in safe bonds, right? And believe me, I was up close and personal and saw that with somebody that I was helping get out of this mess. But here we have an HV of 40. In my entire life, I never remember an HV that high in my entire life. And a lot of things, a lot of bad things happen when a market has such a wild swing like that. A lot of people who are leveraged get killed. Bonds blow up. This is not a good thing to see bonds go from go straight up and then straight down like that. And then now straight back up, I guess. But bonds doing okay in here, but certainly not worth buying, obviously, at this juncture, because they're all over the place. And there's a lot of stocks that are all over the place. All right, let's get to these. Um, we could talk about that. Okay, ZBH. ZBH is one I recommended in the service and he's short on an hourly bow tie. Well, here's the thing, nothing wrong with being a little bit more aggressive, and I've been guilty of trading around some of my short positions lately, so I'm not gonna say not to do it, but I'm not seeing the bow tie yet on that one, on an hourly basis. Let's take a look at a half hour chart. Yeah, so on a half hour chart, a little sloppy, but yeah, you can call that a bow tie, and it's just begun to retrace higher. It's not a perfect setup on an hour, a half hour chart, but I, I think I see what you're saying. It looks like it's topped out. It looks like it could be in trouble. I thought it was a little weaker than it was. Otherwise, I wouldn't have mentioned it. But yeah, it looks like it's still in trouble in here, kind of a thrust followed by a, a pullback. And by the way, I was telling my service peeps lately and last night that, look, usually with something, and let me just take a look at ACGL. I think that's a textbook poster child example. Notice we had this big thrust lower, and notice it only went up a couple of days, three days, in fact, before it triggered. That's the kind of shorts we like, like VLDR, same sort of action there. Sold off really hard, went up a few days, and then triggered and imploded. You want to try to catch these shorts at a higher level, as, as high of level as possible, and with as few days as possible in the pullback after coming off those high levels, okay? as opposed to catching shorts at lower levels with a lot of days. Now, here's the thing, we're, we're kind of left with a lot of shorts that are at relatively lower levels that have pulled back for quite a few days, okay? Now, the only thing is, I mean, that's an aggressive play going after intraday, not that I've not been, <laughs> double negative there, not that I don't get sucked in by the flickering ticks. I gotta talk to Dave Keller and find out, find out who said that first and do some of these intraday trades. But yeah, I think this one's still in trouble. Kind of a bigger picture pullback, which the methodology doesn't really trade bigger picture pullbacks, but hey, this is all we're left with. And if you do look at like a three-day chart, a four-day, even a weekly chart on some of these, you can see that they're still in quite a bit of trouble. I think if you get really bored, go in and look at all the stocks on a weekly chart basis, and it might kind of clean up things. As I've said before, when in doubt, take the chart out and I've got, watch this. Okay, so what do we have? We take the chart out, you got a big old thrust lower followed by a retrace. A lot of noise in between, don't get me wrong, but if you ever get confused on a chart, draw your lines and then take the chart out. D-E-A. Yeah, this is, uh, Zach, is that on the Landry list? Shame on you. <laughs> Shame. <laughs> Well, the thing, reason I didn't recommend this one is it's got this big old V-shaped recovery at high levels, and then it, it did break out nicely. It did pull back. It looks okay, but the thing that concerns me now is that there are so few longs 
am I going after a long, even though it's kind of mediocre at best? Am I not following all of my general rules that I talk about when it comes to picking stocks, stock selection? Am I just kind of like hoping that maybe these things might work? So just having a hard time getting excited about that. Um, I would like to find out what they're doing for this reach to be defying gravity in here. Info as a short. I can't argue with it, Chris, okay? And I know you're a good stock picker. The only thing, like like the CBH2, it's just going so many days in this pullback. But yeah, I think, you know, we might have to kind of reevaluate how we're doing things here because usually I just like a few days in the pullback. And again, case in point, but every stock looked like this back then. Look at that nice little, and I bet you a hundred bucks is a bow tie. Oh yeah, look at that. Beautiful, I feel like tiny Elvis. Look at that bow tie, that's huge. Beautiful bow tie here off all time highs, three or four little days in the pullback, and then bam, begins to implode nicely, halves in value, kind of like that ACGL and that BLDR we talked about. But now, like I said last week, the bloom might be off the rose with this downtrend. And now we're forced to go into these stocks that have chopped around and worked their way higher, as opposed to this nice little clean bow tie setup like we had back there. So I'm sort of, I, I'm at a, an inflection point with a lot of these guys because like okay do i go in and short because it's not even though it's not a perfect pattern or do i just stick strictly with the methodology well since i have so many shorts on right now still i don't feel like i need to put in put on a whole lot of shorts but the point i'm trying to get to is that we might have to reevaluate things just because of the nature of the market be a little flexible and maybe just if we have to make it look like a grade chart, and I know it's a bad thing to do sometimes, but go out to a little bit higher, higher time frame. Okay, Steve wants to talk about Kayla. K-A-L-A. Yeah, this is one that's trending, but here's my problem with these biotechs, okay? It's up, it's down. I mean, look at the look at the swings in here from nine down to five. What's that, almost 40%? swings over a few days and then straight back up 100%, so 40% down, 100% up, HV 96, I know HV is crazy and everything, but that's the only thing. But yeah, it's trending, put it on your list. This is one that's been on my list as a trending stock. This and DEA and Zoom, of course, and a few other ones, a few other biotechs that escape me at the moment are in my momentum list and will come up in my scans, even if they're not in the momentum list, but because they're so wide and loose. I mean, that's why I showed the DEA yesterday in the service, just because like, hey guys, this is all I could find on the long side. I'm not going after it because it's just a little too crazy. It doesn't really fit what I do, but I want to show you what I'm seeing. So Kayla would fit one of those things that I'm seeing, but for me to get excited, I'd like to see even more uptrend followed by a pullback on that one. You can go ahead and give me the signal. You can go ahead and put the, uh, nobody could see your, your chat. So go ahead and give me the signal on that one, Ed. Maybe I looked at the wrong one. Info short. Info. Oh, you mean Z? Okay, I thought you were. I thought you were hitting at the one in the service. <laughs> yeah, I like this one. Again, same everything I said. You know, all that diatribe I said earlier about the days in the pullback. But yeah, that looks good. I agree. Okay, so I looked at the wrong stock. Yeah, this one's kind of all over the place. But I hear you. Okay, and and here's the other thing. You know, a friend of mine is buying a house and selling a house. I'm like, who would do that right now? I know I'm confusing the issue with facts. It's like, how could how could Zillow be making money, okay? So yeah, I think it's in trouble. This is one of those things where you have to, again, take the chart out, you know, when in doubt, take the chart out. And you can see that it's just, so far it's in trouble, but it's a little wide and loose and unorthodox, but yeah, I think it's still in trouble for sure on that one. With some gold stocks breaking up, he's talking about where if you would enter on pullbacks, NIM, NG, and gold in particular. There's gold, there's that one and ng okay ng is as good as any of them well i would have to see like a knockout move like in this one and just use a light amount in other ones of probably like ten and a half and maybe even a little deeper since we've got this breakout and follow through but yeah i've been watching these goals they just haven't really fit the methodology just yet so yeah as soon as we get a decent little um pullback on those Cats, yeah, here's another one, you know, that's that's it's, it went straight down and then it went straight back up. So why don't we wait for the next pullback on this one? And then, yeah, we might go after that one. Good idea. MR bow tie. Yeah, this one looks okay. Um, 
I do like the way that it came down and bottomed out a little bit. I, I wish this peak here were a little bit lower so we'd have this really long, long, long base. It looks okay, all right? It's not a bad looking stock and it is kind of oil related. I think if you had to buy something, yeah, by all means, good eye on that, Zach. I, you know, this market's been so hard to give a high five. I'll give you a high five on that. Is Oshur a flag or something? Um, no, but if it pulls back, yeah, I mean, it's trending for sure. But yeah, on a pullback. And then, you know, you kind of chopped it around in here a little bit. But if it keeps, if it heads higher when it pulls back, it might be worth it might be worth a shot. You might have some problems way back here though with overhead supply. So we'll have to reevaluate that one on the pullback. Okay, well, we're out of time by like about 10 minutes, but I appreciate you guys uh, asking lots of questions. Good, uh, good crowd today, good bunch. If you are watching recording of this, please join us next week live. We'd love to have you. If you can't find the link, it should be at DaveLandry.com. And if it's not there, DaveLandry.com slash webinar. Everybody stay safe, stay sane, and may the trend be with you.